uh, I want to talk about how um, I got lucky. I never looked at contracts that I signed for a very long time. I was very eager to start a job, any job, and so I signed tons of freelance and full-time contracts I never read, thirsty for a byline on any media site or blog that would have me. Fighting these potential employers on anything, even big red flags in the contracts, was terrifying because I thought if I called attention to the fact that they were hiring me, they would take the offer away. <laughs> um, and that's pretty common for young people fresh on the workforce and in their first adult jobs. We're especially vulnerable to big companies that are preying on cheap and replaceable labor. But at any age, marginalized people are also desperate for work. And after all, we can't all be the diversity hire. So LGBTQ people and people of color are also nervous to ask for any changes to contracts that HR people have assured them, and I'm sure you guys have heard this, standard, nothing to worry about. Everyone signs the same contract. Um, I'm a queer woman, I work in entertainment, and that is a field, uh, like many fields, dominated by straight cis white men. And so when I got a job at a big video site, I didn't think twice about rushing to sign away anything and everything for a writing gig with benefits. So, after eight months at BuzzFeed, I... <laughs> Wink! Um, uh, I went back to being independent, because independent is where my comedy partner, Allison Raskin, who's there, out here somewhere, uh, that's where she and I started. We had this little YouTube channel called Just Between Us, and before we began that big job, that was what we were doing. And uh, so when we left, it was amid concerns over our intellectual property, partly. We wanted to own the work that we were creating. And that, in my opinion, is the only way to have a long-term career. I'll explain. Uh, in a viral article that I wrote last year for Fusion.net, uh, it was called Get Rich or Die Vlogging. I didn't come up with that. That was Nona willis Aronowitz, uh, a genius. Um, but I talked about, in that article, uh, a former colleague of mine named Brittany Ashley, who spent more than two years as one of the most visible actresses on BuzzFeed's collective 17 million subscriber YouTube channel. Brittany, who, co who created, wrote, and acted in an LGBTQ series called Lesbian Princess, which I love, uh, and another video creator, Jenny Lorenzo, who wrote, produced, and acted in the company's Latino channel, Perilike, had been abruptly fired because they worked on weekends on a web series, as an actresses in a web series, in another web series. And their contracts had prevented them from doing any work outside of the company, which my contract had as well. And that's a big part of why I left. So many of us are asked to sign away rights to the work that we do for our employers. Sometimes these clauses are incredibly broad, and they can last for a while after you leave. Not owning all of your ideas can limit your career, especially in an era of job hopping and layoffs. Like, unlike the old days when employee loyalty could transfer into a lifelong unionized job, many creators in traditional Hollywood studios are protected by powerful unions, but the talent plucked for web series or online video are, uh, are usually young, inexperienced, and like I said, marginalized, and they are tasked with navigating companies and contracts that are looking to exploit that. It's sort of, there's no, I mean, um, I will say, prior to, after I wrote this, Hank Green has the Internet Creators Guild, which is sort of trying to be a union for online video, but I think they're on an uphill climb. So, I understand why companies ask this of their employees. For certain industries or workers, these policies might be an okay trade-off in exchange for a regular paycheck, experience, and exposure! <laughs> I wrote that in all caps. <laughs> For struggling artists and writers, especially ones often excluded from mainstream media, being offered access to an audience, and then an audience just like sparkles around it, um, may seem worth toiling away at a company for a starter salary. But the people these, that are signing these contracts, and this is like my big drum that I beat, they should know what they're up against. If you have dreams of, say, having your own TV show, or writing your own screenplay, handing over ownership of your best ideas to a media company could really, really backfire. Um, so I will give some examples of my own uh, moronic work uh, stuff. Okay. So uh, three years ago, I was looking for paid work in New York City, and I gave away a lot of my rights and ideas. Uh, like I said, I never looked at my contracts. Uh, in 2013, I was a staff writer for a website called Thought Catalog, and they asked me if they could publish a book of my essays. I was stoked, right? I 
I did not receive any bonus or book deal or commission on sales of the book. But guys, I got to publish a book. That's incredible. Okay, three years later, I don't work at Thought Catalog and I'm more well known. My fans find the book now and they excitedly purchase it thinking that they're supporting me, but I will never see any of that money. The, most, the, the more high profile I become, the more the book sells for Thought Catalog. When you're 22, I say that like I'm so old now, I'm 28. Am I old? This is like an internet audience. <laughs> I've aged out of my own demographic. Okay. Uh, I think about that every day. Okay. When, <laughs> when you're 22, you're so excited to be doing adulthood right that you go full steam ahead, regardless of the company's policy. Your friends are stoked that you have a dream job. Your family's happy to see you stable. Like, what could be better? When I later got hired at BuzzFeed, it was a similar situation. I was hired first as on-camera talent and then as a scripted series writer for a 55K annual salary. I thought I would stay a couple of months, find another industry gig, and peace out, which is the usual in Hollywood. I had just come to that job from writing on a Nickelodeon sketch show. You bounce around. I ended up staying eight months because the non-compete clause caused me to turn down other work or meetings that would lead to other work. There was a constant push and pull about how much we could do outside of BuzzFeed. It became a cycle. You can't create outside the company, so you can't ever leave the company, so you can't ever grow, so you have to stay, and then you're trapped. I left BuzzFeed in 2015, and they still own a Facebook fan page with my face on it. They can promote whatever they want there, using both my name and my image for the rest of my career. I still show up on their Snapchat account sometimes. They could conceivably cut together all the videos I made for them into a series, sell that series for millions of dollars, and not give me a penny or tell me about it at all. It's 100% legal. So I enjoy being independent. <laughs> but um, as Andy mentioned earlier, uh, because of my podcast, the financial side is less stable to being independent. So uh, I've written about this too. What is it like to be too visible to have a real job, but too broke not to? <laughs> so um, these are some examples I wrote down. So, um, and it's not just me. Uh, one week I was stopped for photos uh, six times while perusing comic books in downtown LA. And then the next week I sat faceless in a room of 40 people vying for a courier job. I've walked a red carpet with $80 in my bank account. Uh, popular YouTube musician Megan Tonjes told me that she performed on VidCon's main stage last year to screaming fans without knowing whether she'd be able to afford groceries later that day. Moderately successful YouTubers like Connor Manning have also told me they were recognized six times at their job selling memberships at the Baltimore Aquarium, or Rosianna Halsey Rojas, who had people freak out at her Topshop register, or Rachel Whitehurst, who was forced to quit her job at Starbucks because fans memorized her schedule. Yeah. So, Allison and I make money now from ads that play before our videos, from freelance writing or acting gigs, from brand deals on YouTube or Instagram. Mostly we do a lot of our YouTube stuff for free. And the influx of income is and remains unpredictable. Um, you know, my ins this is what I like to say. My Instagram account has 425K followers, sometimes 426. It's fluctuating right now, going back and forth. I don't know what the people want. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is it more of my face? Is it less of my face? I don't know. Okay. Um, my Instagram account has 425K followers. I've never made 425K dollars in my life collectively. I don't even know what that would look like. Um, so, like Andy said, recently I launched a podcast called Bad With Money, and the name couldn't be more appropriate. Uh, I never had money, so I never thought about how you got money. I just assume you hopped around from different jobs, like a writing mercenary or like a gun for hire. Um, I never wrote up a budget, I never kept track of where my money was coming from, but it always came from somewhere and I thought one day there'll be a windfall and that'll just fix all the problems I'm doing right now. <laughs> and so, back to the internet. Um, an economist I interviewed likened trying to get famous on YouTube or Twitter or social media to shelling out money for college. In each case, one suffers through hard work and zero to negative income in the hopes of a later payout. The result is that the market is oversaturated with people vying for the same fame. And if there's a line behind you for your job, companies and brands don't have to treat you well. Your subscriber numbers, which rarely make any sense, some channels have millions of views and no subscribers, and others the other way around, become the gatekeepers for your financial success. And whether they realize it or not, 
Our fans dictate our every financial move. Every time Allison and I post a branded video, we make money, but we lose subscribers. A video we created for a skincare line, for instance, drew ire from fans writing, enough with the product placement. Despite this being our third branded video ever, after doing 200 videos for free. <laughs> YouTuber Anna Akana, fed up with comments calling her a sellout, posted a video explaining how brand without brand deals, YouTubers can't survive. Some fans understood, others vowed never to watch her again. Recently, Rosie of the channel Rose and Rosie took to Twitter to express her exasperation at commenters' inability to understand that the people behind their favorite videos need to eat. <laughs> brand deals are even more important now. In the last week or so, the hashtag YouTube is over party, <laughs> which I love, uh, started trending in response to new regulations on YouTube ads. It turns out YouTube is implementing or trying or has is started uh, enforcing a new standard where videos that don't meet certain moral or taste criteria are unable to be monetized. YouTubers are freaking out. It's still unclear if these new rules will stick or if there will be enough noise made in response or, I mean, I still, I'm still parsing through. Like, I have no idea what this means. And every day, Allison and I are like, are our videos still monetized? What's happening? Uh, we're hoping that YouTube just forgot we're a channel. Um, <laughs> But the good thing about this is that YouTubers are making a stink online about money or their inability to make money, and that's a welcome change because it feels like YouTubers talk to each other about money less than maybe the average worker because there's an added humiliation to not making a living wage when fans believe you're famous. So it adds an extra layer of silence. This system of not talking about these kind of things, I think, especially hurts Women and people of color and LGBTQ people and non-binary people, marginalized people, there are limited job opportunities in the entertainment industry for people in these groups. And YouTube is like a really big foot in the door. So though diversity is a big buzzword, in practice, nearly 80% of showrunners are still white men. So for marginalized artists, a creative writing job, directing, acting, having their own channel, being the you know, be all end all of their own content, that's like a godsend. And a major reason companies can get away with these one-sided agreements is because I, I think we don't know our own worth. We think we should be grateful for the chance, often given to us by straight cis white men, and when they, overpay, when they overwork us or underpay us, we should be thrilled with our own exploitation. We're just lucky to be there. So, marginalized people at media companies, protect yourself. Know your worth. They bring us in to make themselves look good, and they don't care about us as creators. Not every workplace has such stringent policies. Years ago, while I was on staff for a small news blog, I got an offer to write a piece for the New York Times Magazine. My bosses understood. It made their blog look more legit to have a writer that was also working for the Grey Lady. It was a win-win. Other video places I've heard about have their writers go off and sell TV shows or sell movies, and they're welcomed back into the fold with open arms because their, their success means success for that company. So this company welcomed me back after I had finished my big opportunity. They were happy for my individual success. In other words, there is a way for companies to produce good work while still supporting their own employees' career growth. As the writer Ashley Ford tweeted, there's nothing wrong with making trade-offs, but compromise shouldn't, believe, shouldn't mean your employer always gets the better deal. You should win, too. Here's a story about this very festival. A female speaker messaged me asking what my rate was going to be to speak with you guys here today. She and I were doing the exact same talk, and I told her what I was making. She was making much less than that. She was scared to ask for a higher fee in case they reneged on asking her to speak today. I told her, it's a festival for independent creators. My talk is about money and valuing yourself. Tell them I sent you. <laughs> I like to cause trouble. Um, <laughs> she went to them and asked for more money and cited my rate as an example, and they upped her fee. So, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.